Hello and welcome to the Tools of Appreciation. I'm Carol Xiong. Today, we'll be looking at how to appreciate the visual arts. Say you're walking down the street or perhaps scrolling on your phone. By the end of the day, you would have inadvertently consumed hundreds of images. Now, there's a saying that goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. So in reality, you'll have also inadvertently consumed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of words and all of their associated feelings. Today, we're going to take those feelings up from the subconscious level to the conscious level, so that next time, when you open your eyes to see, you'll be more aware of what you feel and how. This is important because even though we all have an innate ability to feel, being able to do so consciously allows us to be more nuanced in our feelings and allows us, therefore, to be more in touch with the human condition. Before we begin, please take a look at this painting over here, Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin. Jot down a few things that you observe and perhaps what it makes you feel. We will be revisiting this painting at the end of our talk, and by then, hopefully, you'll find out that you have a few more insights. So how do we appreciate art? Well, first of all, you need to gather your basic information. Such simple things as the artist, the title, the medium, the dimensions, and so forth. Then you need to dig deep. You need to find out what techniques are being used. What is the provenance, meaning how did this painting come to be? And what is the historical background of this painting? Finally, you need to forget about number one and number two so that you can feel very deeply from a subconscious level. A lot of you might be scoffing at the idea of how after all this work, we only amount to something so intangible as feeling. Now, if you thought that feelings are for the weak, then you're wrong, because feelings are actually amongst the most powerful forces of nature. It's feelings that drive us to kill and to love, feelings that take us to war and give us the courage to end them. So if you're able to be more attuned to your feelings and to understand them, then only then can you call yourself a master of yourself and of the human condition. So without further ado, let's get started with cultivating your feelings, with understanding how to gather the basic information when appreciating art. Title and artist are pretty easy to understand. What is medium? Quite simply, the medium of a work comprises of the materials that make up the artwork. For instance, the giotto to the bottom left here is made of tempera on wooden panel. The next work, the Gauguin, to the center, is of a different medium. This one is woodcut block. And finally, the Raphael has a different medium once again. This one is oil on panel. You can find out what the medium is by visiting the website or plaque associated with a piece of art. For instance, here on the National Gallery of Arts website, we can see very clearly that the Raphael is made with oil on panel. Dimension is another piece of important basic information. This is particularly useful in the world of digital media because we often don't quite know the real size of a piece of artwork until we see the dimensions or view it in person. For instance, you might be surprised to find out how small Starry Night really is. Here, we can see that it's only 73 centimeters times 92 centimeters. Notice how we say the height first and then the length. This is contrary to our usual customs of saying length first and then height. In fact, in the world of art appreciation, we always use the following order, height times width, and then if applicable, times depth. Be sure to remember this because this is often different from the world of photography and digital images, which goes by the usual custom of width times height. And of course, this information can also be found on the plaque or website associated with a piece of art. Next, you need to find out the accession number and the location of the piece of artwork, because often these are the two pieces of information that stay with the piece of art forever. The accession number refers to the unchanging number that refers to that piece of work and that work only. It tells us when this work was acquired and the sequence in which it was acquired. The location tells us more. It tells us exactly where this piece of artwork is found. 
This is important because there are often many different editions of the same piece of art, and many pieces of art named with the same title. And often also, the same piece of art has many different names in different languages. And so you can see how the accession number and location are key to being specific about which work we're actually referring to. Of course, that information is also on the plaque and website associated with the piece of work. Now we're ready to graduate onto step two, really taking the work apart. To begin, we need to define the picture frame. Now be careful, picture frame does not refer to the protective barrier surrounding the painting. Instead, in the world of art appreciation, we call this the picture frame. In other words, the picture frame is the perimeter surrounding the picture. We can use the picture frame to talk about the piece of art. For instance, we can say that Mona Lisa inhabits a lot of the picture frame and that the little princess is at the bottom center of the picture frame. Now I've got a trick question for you. Where is the picture frame in this picture? Think carefully. If you answered over here, then you're correct. The artist has played a little trick on us. We call this trompe l'oeil, which means fool the eye. In effect, the artist has drawn in a fake picture frame on which the girl's hands are resting. And then he has surrounded the real picture frame with a wooden protective barrier, which lay people would call a picture frame. Are you getting inceptioned out? Because I am. Let's keep going. Next, we need to find out what the picture plane is. The picture plane is like a window or a force field that separates our world from the world of the painting. Of course, we can use the picture plane to talk about the painting. For instance, we can say that the monkey is close to the picture plane and that the boats are far away from the picture plane. We can also say that the boats are parallel to the picture plane. You get the idea? Good artists are able to use elements such as picture frame and picture plane for expressive purposes. For instance, here, the farmer and his daughter are extremely close to the picture plane. How does that make you feel? Perhaps a little intimidated? If so, the artist was very effective in eliciting the emotion he wanted from you. Next, let's talk about lines. There are two types of lines, visible and invisible. Within visible lines, the most common are contour lines. Contour lines, quite simply, are the edges of a shape. So you can clearly see the black contour lines in the painting Dark Eyes to the left of the screen here. But there are also contour lines that are extremely thin, such as at the edge of the cloak that Mother Mary is wearing. We can see where the cloak is ending and where the farm is starting. So right at that edge is the contour line. Another type of visible line is the hatching line, as well as the cross hatching line. Hatching lines are lines that are all going in the same direction and that create a sense of dimension and shading. And cross hatching lines are lines that go in crossed directions and they're also used for shading. You can see Da Vinci using both hatching lines as well as cross hatching lines to shade in his sketches. Finally, in the world of invisible lines, the most common is the implied line. The implied line can be implied through the point of a finger or an arm or a sword, or most commonly through the lines of your eyes. This particular type of implied line is called directional gaze. Directional gaze, as you can see here, is when the characters, the subjects within a painting are gazing at something and that gaze makes the viewer's eyes also gravitate towards the thing or person that they're gazing at. For instance here, the directional gaze is making the viewer also focus on the baby. So even if you didn't know any history or any story behind the birth of the Christ child, you would know that the star of the show in this painting is probably the baby because everyone else is staring at it. These implied lines are further enhanced by the staff that the man is holding. So the staff, which is a visible line, is adding, reinforcing the implied lines of the directional gaze. 
further focusing your eyes on the baby. Regardless of whether the lines are visible or invisible, they all have a certain energy to them. So for instance, horizontal lines, which are literally lying down flat, are extremely calm when used in a composition. Bingham here displays this to great effect because he uses the canoe and horizon line all to depict an extremely calm atmosphere. Conversely, vertical lines have a little more energy because they're standing up straight, but they also are quite stable. And then at the top of the energy pyramid is the diagonal line. Diagonal lines are not only standing up, but they're about to fall down. So they're always in a state of instability and therefore have implied motion and drama. Delacroix employs a lot of diagonal lines, whether in terms of his implied or visible lines in his painting, Liberty Leading the People. You can see how energetic this painting is because of that. Delacroix also uses diagonal lines to help focus the eyes of the viewer on what is important. Specifically, all of the lines seem to converge on the French flag, which is key to the French Revolution and which is the topic of this painting. There's another way of looking at lines, linear or painterly. Linear lines are very crisp and clean, whereas painterly lines are more blurred. Linear lines are like lines that you see when you really focus a camera. And painterly lines are ones in which you see the brushstrokes of paint of the artist. Now these two types of lines can also be used for expressive purposes. For instance, David uses linear lines to depict a sense of clarity and logic, whereas Delacroix uses painterly lines to depict romanticism and energy. Next, we have texture, which is pretty easy to understand. Texture is the feeling of the canvas or surface of the work if you literally touch it. Impasto is one technique of texture. Impasto is when the paint is piled so thick onto the canvas or the board that you could literally see the grooves of paint. And if you touched it, it would be very rough. The opposite of that is glaze. Glaze is when the artist thins out the paint so much so that the surface of the painting is quite flat, like an ice rink. If you ran your hand across a work that is painted with lots of glaze, then it's quite smooth. Now we're ready to move into the world of light and color. In terms of light, we can think of the parts of a painting as light in value or dark in value. The parts that have lots of light, which is to say lots of white mixed into the paint, we can call high value. And the opposite, that is the parts that are quite dark, the parts that are mixed with lots of black, we can call low value. So to put this in practice, for instance, we can look at the painting to the left. We can see that the background is quite black, quite dark, so that's low value. On the other hand, the leg is quite bright, quite high in terms of white, so we can say that's high value. Luckily, Whatever we notice in terms of grayscale is the same in color. So anytime you're called to think about light and dark values on a painting that is perhaps in color, you can imagine it in grayscale and everything will be clear. While on the topic of light, we also need to think about the directional light, which is where the light source or sources are coming from. For example, in the Goya painting, it's quite obvious. The lantern is giving off the directional light. In other cases, you might need to find out where the directional light is coming from based off of the shadows and the places that have the highest amount of spotlight. So in the Caravaggio to the left, we can imagine a light source coming from perhaps off to the left bottom of the picture frame. Either way, the higher the contrast between light and dark values within the painting, the more dramatic the painting becomes. We can refer to this technique with two particular words. The first one is chiaroscuro. Chiaro means light and scuro means dark in Italian. So chiaroscuro means the juxtaposition of light and dark. A more extreme version of chiaroscuro is tenebrism. 
Tenebrism is when the background is completely blacked out, and the figures that have high values are almost as though there's a spotlight shining on them. The Caravaggio is a great example of tenebrism. Now let's add in some splashes of color. At the most basic level, we have primary colors. These are the colors that cannot be divided any further, and they're yellow, red, and blue. Now once we start mixing, we can get all of the other colors on the spectrum. For instance, if we mix 50% of one primary with another primary, we get secondary colors. If you mix blue and red, for example, you get purple, which is a secondary color. You can keep mixing. You can get tertiary colors, for instance, when you have one third of one primary and two thirds of another. Another way of looking at colors is to see whether they're analogous or complementary. Analogous colors are close to one another on the color wheel. Specifically, they need to be within two primary colors of one another. For example, turquoise and green are analogous. On the other hand, when we have colors that are opposite one another on the color wheel, we call them complementary. For instance, green and red are complementary to one another. Now, it's important to note how in Western aesthetics, we usually prefer complementary colors, colors that work in harmony of one another. However, in Eastern aesthetics, we often prefer complementary colors. Think of those bright red buildings with green tiled roofs and bright blue accents in the Forbidden City in Beijing. Finally, let's talk about saturation. Saturation refers to how pure a color is. Now, often we might confuse that with value, but Value refers to how much white or black is added to the hue or color. So for instance, if you see this color star by Johannes Itten, you can see how the different hues are still quite pure, they're the same saturation, but different amounts of white or black are added along each strip of each hue. In contrast, saturation refers to how pure something is. So to decrease the saturation of something, we need to mix that hue with its complement. For instance, on this color strip to the right side of the screen, we can see that we have orange on one side and blue on the other. They're complements of each other. And so as we mix more and more drops of the complementary color with the other color, we come up with less and less saturated colors. The color in the very middle, the grayish hue, is the least saturated out of the bunch. Now, let's put our knowledge of colors to the test. To the left, we have Monet's Waterloo Bridge. We can immediately notice how all of the hues chosen here are very high in value, and that they're tinted with bits of white. As well, Monet has chosen hues of very low saturation, in that the purplish blue is always contaminated a bit with yellowish orange, and vice versa. Finally, we can see the complementary colors at play of orange-yellow contrasting against purplish-blue. Now, the painting on the right side, the Van Gogh, is also made out of yellow-orange plus purple-blue. But this one is much more vivid because of the higher saturation here. The effect of it is that it gives off a stronger sense of crispness between the contrasts of color. So, in review, we've done step one, step two, and finally now, we're able to go on to step three. To do so, let's return to the painting that we saw at the very beginning of this talk. Remember this? This is Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin. Now, in terms of the basic information, we know that the medium is oil on wood panel, and the dimensions are 174 times 121, and that the location is in a museum in Milan. Now, all this basic information is pretty straightforward. You can find it from a website associated with the painting. Let's move on to the observations, starting with the composition. In terms of composition, we can see a large group of people consisting of the bride, Mary, and her groom, Joseph, as well as their priest in the center of those two, and their friends and family at the very bottom of the picture frame and close to the picture plane. Further back in the picture plane and higher up in the picture frame, 
we see smaller groups of people. That's the middle ground. And finally, in the background, at the very high end of the picture frame and very back of the picture plane, we see a large building with a big dome on top. That's probably a church. This composition gives off a sense of order and calm thanks to its symmetry, but also thanks to its use of lines. Specifically, we see a lot of vertical lines, which give off a sense of stability, as well as horizontal lines, which give off a sense of calm. In addition, we see these recurring shapes, for instance, the tiles on the floor or the arcs in the building, once again giving it a sense of calm, order, and stability. Now, there are a couple other lines that are pretty important. Foremost, we see some implied lines. We see the implied lines of the directional gaze of Mary and Joseph, both staring at Mary's hand. Probably it has a ring on it, which is central to the wedding. As well, we see implied lines from the tile on the floor. We can see that the tiles, the white parts of the tiles, are pointed kind of at our couple and framing the two into one little part of the division of the floor space. Finally, we see the implied lines as delineated by the little dots of red throughout the painting. Now, red is a very expensive color to use, so its use was also very intentional most of the time, especially back in Raphael's day. But you can see how red is used quite liberally here in order to lead our eyes to dart from Mary to her friend to the cardinals in the back. And this gives a sense of motion to the painting. Next, we can talk about texture. The texture of this painting is probably quite smooth, seeing as we don't really see any breaststrokes or any bits of paint that are popping off the surface of the painting. And then we can talk about light. In this case, this painting is quite brightly lit, and there's not as much contrast as we saw in our previous examples of the Caravaggio or the Goya. So once again, it's not so dramatic, but instead quite calm and comfortable. The use of colors is something to note here. One, because of the use of red, which I already mentioned, but two, also because of the use of complementary colors. Specifically, we see two different pairs of complementary colors, which give off a sense of harmony for this piece of art. First of all, we see the sky, which is blue, against the floor and building, which are on the orange side. And these two are lower in saturation, so they make a complementary pair. But then there's the high complementary pair, consisting of Mary and Joseph. You see, Mary is wearing red and blue, which are complements to green and orange. How fitting that the two people within the couple are wearing complementary colors to one another. And so they literally complement one another as a couple. I think that Raphael did a wonderful choice here with the choice of color, specifically for the couple. So altogether, taking this piece into consideration, we can now be free to do the third step, which is to feel. Now, I've explained each of the feelings as I went along, but you can jot down what additional feelings you feel with this painting, and later on, perhaps substitute this painting, but go through the same checklist with some other paintings for practice. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, we'll talk about how to analyze music, and afterwards, for the third part of this video series, we'll talk about how to analyze literature. I hope to see you soon and have a great day.